Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC2 at QuickSurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. For those of you who have, thank you for subscribing. And as always, the links to subscribe are in the show notes for each and every episode. So uh, just visit that homepage, quicksurf.com, and uh, find the latest episode for The Geekinator. And there's a nice little subscribe heading with the links there for the various formats that you can subscribe to. Let's go ahead and get into the cool stuff that I found for this episode. Uh, starting off over at the Bo Boston Herald, over at bostonherald.com, Google clocks in with smartwatch software. Google is bringing its Android operating system to smartwatches, opening the doors for a flood of high-tech wearable devices for consumers, experts said. Google said yesterday that it will release Android Wear, that's what it's called, is Android Wear, a version of its popular software tailored for wearable devices uh, to hardware manufacturers. Google's vision of a smartwatch differs slightly from others that have hit the market with an emphasis on its predictive assistant, Google Now. So pretty interesting. Uh, I think it's really interesting and likely that this development will bear a lot of fruit, said Roger Kay, a technology analyst and founder of Endpoint Technologies. I'm curious uh, how this is going to play out. Um, I've recently made an investment in um, uh, Fitbit. I don't have the uh, bracelet yet, but I, I bought a Fitbit Flex. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of... This has largely been driven by the fact that my, my iPhone, I have an iPhone 5C, and uh, this has largely been driven by the fact that this has the motion accelerator or the motion processor, whatever you want to call it. And um, so it, it, it uh, if you have the Fitbit software installed, it's probably a little bright for you to see, but if you have the uh, Fitbit software installed on, on the uh, iPhone, um, it keeps track of your stuff. Now, the reason why I bought the Flex is because... This does, I, I don't keep my phone on me when I sleep. So the Flex does track your sleep quality. And for me, that's a huge deal. I, I am a notoriously bad sleeper. Ask anybody who has spent any amount of time sleeping in the same room as me. So this is largely kind of just an instrumentation project for me. However, with that being said, you know, these smartwatches and everything, what I really want to see on a smartwatch is a lot of Fitbit type instrumentation i'd love to see like you know not only an activity monitor but maybe built into the watch an oxygen sensor so you know what your oxygen levels are uh a heartbeat sensor you know let's in, in addition to making the watch smart let's put enough instrumentation on there so that you can actually monitor your health blood glucose monitor i don't i'm not sure if you can do that through the skin or not but still you know People make a big deal about smartwatches and how you can like answer your phone with the watch. And, you know, I'm, I'm less interested in that. And I'm more interested in a, in a bracelet that I can wear that that uh, has uh, good instrumentation and even potentially information for uh, emergency personnel. So, for example, there is a gentleman at, at work that's 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 diabetic and he has tattooed on his arm you know, type one diabetic, you know, bunch of information, bunch of his medical information tattooed on his arm. So if he's ever in a car wreck, they know, oh gosh, this guy has, you know, we need to, he's this thing, we need to do X, Y, Z. It'd be great if, if there was some type of wearable device that could also relay that information where, you know, medical personnel had a dongle they wore or something and the device knew uh, you know, it was a special dongle that only emergency uh, medical personnel would have, and the device would know that and and display, you know, basic medical information for it that was, you know, meant for emergency personnel. 
So I think this is a good first step in the smartwatch thing with Android Wear, but what I really want to see is have it a lot more personal, a lot less about, oh, look, I have a display, I can display information on here that I could just as easily get on my phone and, oh, I can answer phone calls. You know, I, that I really don't, that I care a lot less about. And that's actually really easy to do. You just need to have the display and a decent battery life. So uh, I'm curious to see how, what form Android Wear takes uh, with regards to this. Uh, from Digital Trends, Microsoft is preparing to show off Microsoft Office for the iPad during a late March event. This is uh, pretty cool. Detailed on The Verge earlier today, Microsoft is planning to officially unveil Office for iPad and display the software at Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella's first press event later this month. Focusing on mobile devices and cloud computing at the media event on March 27th in San Francisco, it's likely that the software will be somewhat similar to the Office mobile application that's currently available for the iPhone. The version of uh, Office for iPhone requires an Office 365 subscription in order to edit documents and spreadsheets. Thus, it's likely that Microsoft will require the same for the iPad version. Not surprising. I totally would expect something like that. But still, pretty cool nonetheless. You know, I mean, Microsoft is finally starting to come to terms with the fact that, you know, there are other mobile platforms besides what Microsoft provides. And you they may have to support this if they want to continue in the software realm. So pretty neat. Uh, from the Sydney Morning, from the Sydney Morning Herald over at smh.com.au, Apple is launching a cheaper eight gigabyte iPhone 5C. This is good news. Apparently, the 5C hasn't been as good of a seller as they were hoping it would be. Uh, as devices running Google's Android operating system chip away at Apple's market share in uh, smartphones and tablets, the tech giant has launched a cheaper iPhone and updated iPad. A cheaper, lower-capacity version of Apple's plastic-backed iPhone 5C is now on sale in Australia, China, and Europe. So if you're in the U.S., you won't really see this, but still pretty cool nonetheless. Uh, the new iPhone 5C has 8 gigs of uh, storage. It costs $679 outright compared with $739 for the 16-gigabyte model, according to Apple's Australian online store. So pretty interesting. Um We'll see if that boost sells. It's not a huge drop in price, but still, we'll see if it boost sells. From UPI.com and their science news, NASA has released new images of the Monkey Head Nebula. Let's see if I can zoom in on this here. Can I? Yes, I can. All right, here we go. I, uh, For those of you who are watching the video... See if I can get this to stop focusing on me. There you go. Look at that beaut. Look at that. Yeah. Uh, definitely go check these out on the website. Um, beautiful photos. Beautiful photos. Uh, you know, NASA generally does do beautiful photos, but these are some really stunning photos. They're from the Hubble Space Telescope, so you know they're going to look good. Uh, you know, I thought I'd share that with everybody just because it's awesome. From Bloomberg Business Week, Pandora lifts subscription cost of ad-free music on royalty fees. Pandora Media Inc., the biggest online radio service, raised the price of its advertising-free Pandora. One option for some users, uh, citing rising royalty costs. Listeners who now pay $36 a year for the service will be asked to pay $3.99 a month, Pandora said yesterday on its blog. For new subscribers, the price will be $4.99 a month. So this is starting to approach satellite radio um, costs, but, uh, you know, Pandora is still pretty good. Definitely check it out. From GameSpot.com, Blizzard is in the news. They are pulling the plug on Diablo 3's infamous auction house. This could be good or 
bad news. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not a Diablo 3 player or a, really a user of the Diablo 3 auction house. So, you know, this is fairly a, a non, pretty much a non-event for me. But, you know, there could be people out there on the internet that, that uh, this is you know, bad news for. Uh, Blizzard has killed off the controversial Diablo 3 auction house ahead of the launch of the game's first expansion, Reaper of Souls, next week. The service was shut down at approximately 10 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. No new auctions can now be made on the auction house, and remaining auctions have been automatically finalized, either going to the highest bidder or returned to the seller. Players will still be able to claim gold and items from the auction house under their in-game stash until June 24th. So, pretty interesting. Um, I'm curious if it uh, will come back. You know, it, this has been something that's been coming for a while. Uh, they originally, uh, you know, announced that they were going to be killing it off way back in September of last year. So, uh, you know, if you're a user of the auction house, bummer. Otherwise, uh, you know, for a lot of us who don't use it, this is probably a non-event. That will do it for this edition of the Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. And for those of you who have, thank you so much. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.